morning, we're going to continue our Desiring God series, which is really focusing on what we believe. And all these boxes are not random smiley faces, but they're symbols of what we believe. That we believe that there's more joy in Jesus and pursuing him than anything else. That that's what conversion is, is when we find our greatest joy in him. And worship, which what we just did through song and other ways, is just expressing that joy in all sorts of different ways. And love is simply expressing that joy towards others with the hope that they might find their greatest joy in him. And this morning, we're going to continue that series, but those first five weeks were foundational. They were the basis upon we're building everything on top of. So even this morning as we talk about prayer, one of our belief statements is that we believe that prayer is the work. Do we believe that, church? More than seven of us this morning believe that. You're with us this morning, but we believe that prayer is the work. And I got an email from a friend that was going to share about one of her prayer stories, and she sent it to me. She couldn't make it this morning, so I'm going to read her email to you guys, and this is from Karen, and maybe you know the Jarvises. She says, I went to my second doctor's appointment for physical therapy, and my doctor asked me to please forgive her because she was very emotional. She had just gotten an email that her dear friend was dying from leukemia. You know what that means to me. After a bone marrow transplant didn't work, it was killing him, and all of his organs were shutting down and failing. Hospice was called in. He was 19 years old. So Karen walks in to her doctor, and her doctor simply says this, Forgive me for being so emotional. I can't hold it together. And then she burst into tears. Karen had met this doctor once. And Karen's sitting there, and Karen says, I met her once, so therefore she was on my pray watch list, because that's what we mean at Vintage Grace, right? Everyone we come in contact with her, we're just praying and watching for ways to love them. So Karen, if you know her, she's this really shy, timid gal, maybe like many of us, not like me, but, and she's sitting there, and her doctor's in tears, and she's crying, and she said, I am so sorry, and listened to her talk, and apologized for crying so hard, then without thinking, I still don't know what came over me, I said, can I pray for you? And then she's realizing, what did I just say? Because if she says yes, I have to. She says, Karen says, I've never done that before. I usually just say my prayers in my head, but because of Pray Watch, I just blurted it out. I couldn't help it. She said, the doctor responded, I don't believe in God. So Karen's like, well, now what do I do? This is awkward. <laughs> then after a few seconds and much debating with herself, the doctor talked herself into saying, sure, why not? Can't hurt. So Karen, our shy, timid gal, says, well, I'm going to pray for you. And as she's praying, she prays these words. One sentence that came to her, she believes, was this prayer that God would show himself to this doctor big. Two weeks later, Karen got a phone call. He's alive. Karen, you don't understand. He's alive. The doctor said he wasn't going to live a day, let alone two. He's alive. The organs are working again. And Karen couldn't help but hear that phrase, prayer is the work. This doctor said, I'm not saying I believe in God yet. You hear that word? Like, that's kind of how we talk about people, right? Pre-believers. I'm not sure I believe in God yet, but I know that something's happening. Karen said, I knew God was going to do something. I just didn't know it was going to be this. See, we believe that prayer is the work. It's why we pray. That's all we can do. So this morning we're going to talk about prayer. And I even remember planting the church with our team and many of us moving up here saying, look, we can't be strategic enough to plant a church. Here's what we can do. We can pray. So we prayed, and we watched, and we prayed, and Coogan getting to join us this morning is, is a great gift to us as a, a friend from Orange County, but just to pray and to say, God, we want you to do big things. And one of the things that we prayed for often was we prayed that God would give us partners. And one of those partners is a group called the Stamps Foundation. And the Stamps Foundation is a group that invests in young men and women who are praying about going into full-time ministry. And the theory is, instead of having them go to school full-time and work a little bit and flip burgers to pay for the bills, that they would invest into young men and women so that they would get an opportunity to participate in ministry and see if that was a call for their life. I was a Stamps intern 14 years ago. So 14 years ago, I got to be one of those interns. And one of the gifts that we got is that Stamps invested in a guy by the name of Chris Tomes. You remember Chris? And Chris was our Stamps intern, and now this year we have a new Stamps intern. His name's Michael Dacey. Michael, come on forward. You saw him on the drums. You probably didn't see him because he's behind the boxes. Elders, come on forward. Rick, why don't you come on forward? But right now we're going to do something where we want to commission Michael as one of our leaders, but also on behalf of the elder board. Michael, you can take a seat. We're going to make it nice and awkward for you. But I've asked our elders to come forward and to just share a little bit on what it means, because one of our values is not just we believe that prayer is the work, but we believe in sending. We believe in investing people so that they will invest in people. It's what we do every Sunday. You come and receive the words, you can go and be the word for others. In the same way, that's what our staff is. 
So Eric, on behalf of the congregation, what's our commitment to Michael as one of our staff guys? Uh, yeah, so I'm up here on behalf of you guys. So church, uh, we know that Michael not only leads worship, he sets up for worship, he helps with the kids, he does so much. So we the church just want to say we love you, we thank you, and we are for you. All right, right church? Yeah. And Dave, is, as one of our elders, would you speak over Michael in the context of us as for us as elders. Well, yeah, our leadership structure at, uh, at Vintage Grace is designed after the biblical pattern of appointing elders. And Michael, what that means for you is you have leaders beyond just your direct report, Drew, that you've got a group of elders who will uh, support you, who are a resource to you, and who are committed to praying for you. And something I love about our partnership is that we want to have shepherding couples. Eric's one of our elders, Dave's one of our elders, but Michael's also one of our elders. And Mike and Hallie have committed to also being a part of this process for Michael's benefit and God's glory as a shepherding couple. That's right, Michael. Hallie and I are so excited to come alongside you as your shepherding couple. And as you experience the ups and downs of life and ministry, we are here to support you and encourage you. And um, as you learn to depend on Jesus for everything, and we are praying for you, and we're excited to see how God continues, you, continues to use you here at Vintage Grace and to help all of us here treasure Jesus more. So. Michael, I, I want to commit to you as your senior pastor to not abuse you, <laughs> to not make you make copies every day, only every other day, um, but really to invest in you. We want you to be a lifelong minister for the gospel. So we as elders, we as leaders, we as staff, we as congregation, we want to support you in this pursuit, not just financially because of Stamp's gracious gift, but also for your soul. We want you to be a great husband someday, a great dad. We want you to cherish Christ in every possible way. We want you to see that in these relationships and in us, in us well. Now, Rick, you're the director for the Stamps Foundation. You and I have talked for many years, and I thank you as a senior pastor for your investment. Anything you want to say to Michael this time? Sure. I, I, first, I want to say that I'm really, really happy to be here today. Uh, Drew, he mentioned that he was an intern. Well, he was an intern at my home church, First Baptist Church of Downey, and that was uh, a significant period of time ago. And so I've, I've seen Drew as an intern. I've worked with Drew as he was the supervising pastor for several interns at RCC. So the relationship between Stamps and, and Drew goes back quite a while. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, it's just starting with you. And as the, uh, as the director of the foundation, I can tell you that we as the trustees of uh, the James L. Stamps Foundation understand we are stewards of the resources that God has entrusted to our care. And, and as stewards, we believe we're making a great investment in investing in your life for the next two years. So on behalf of the foundation, I want to make the formal commitment that during this two-year period of time, we will be the primary financial support for the internship period of time. But, but I need you to understand that re the financial resources that the foundation is providing is not the only thing that God is going to invest in your life. In, in fact, the money is probably secondary to a number of things. The most important thing that God is going to do for you and invest in your life during the next two years is right in front of you. It's the people that are in the congregation. It's the, the time that they're going to take to, to help you to understand God's call in your life so that during this next two-year period of time, you can yield yourself to the moving of the Spirit in such a way that God will let you know where he wants you to be after the internship is done. Right? Now, we understand also that if an internship is going to work, it's got to be based upon the solid foundation of the Word of God. So on behalf of the trustees, I'd like to present to you a Bible. And, and it's a study Bible. It's a really nice study Bible. Um, <laughs> and and uh, it, it's our hope that you will daily uh, return to this and, and look upon the Word of God for guidance and leadership as to where he would take you during your life. And, and you'll notice we have it inscribed on the front, the JL Stamps intern, so that this internship is going to fly by so fast you're not going to believe it. But when it's done, as you look back upon this period of time, you'll have something to remind you of our association with the foundation and, and just the very reason why you're here. So on, on behalf of the Stamps Foundation, it's our privilege and our pleasure to be a part of uh, what's about to take place. Very cool. Michael, anything Thanks. you want to say? Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. I want you to show me. When, when he said you're going to be a great father someday, I saw you look specifically at somebody. Come on, show me who it is. He's in the back. In the very back. Okay, come on. Come on, stand up. 
And by someday, we mean a long way away. There she is. (laughs) When she gets embarrassed, you can blame that on me. (laughs) Well, guys, I'm just, I'm really excited to be a part of this. And I'm so thankful for just the gift that this is to be able to continue to serve and to be supported by you guys, the Stance Foundation and and this amazing elder board and and staff. And I just want to thank you guys for being so supportive. And um, it's just a joy to serve here. So thank you. One of the cool things is when I announced that we were looking for a worship pastor, everyone's response was, what's going to happen to Michael? And we're like, we don't know. But God provides a new role and a new opportunity for him to, to serve here. Michael, as the shepherding couple, will you, uh, will you pray for, for Dr. Dacey? <laughs> Absolutely. Lord Jesus, we are so excited for what you're doing here at Vintage Grace and what you're doing throughout the world and building your church and building your kingdom. Thank you for bringing Michael Dacey to our church family and for using him to help all of us to treasure you more. Um, I pray that throughout his internship, as he is tempted to rely on his own strength and to, um, that he, you would just remind him and help him to look to you in all things, that he would, that he would find his strength in you and um, that you'd use him in a mighty way to, to impact um, your kingdom here in this area. But Lord, we are also so grateful for the Stamps Foundation and their leadership and generosity just in um, not only providing Michael Dacey, but Chris Tomes and their investment in Drew's life and many other um, lives throughout the country and probably throughout the world at this point, Lord, that they've been able to impact for your kingdom. So we We're excited to be a part of that, and we're excited to see how you continue to build your church, how you continue to build your kingdom, both here in El Dorado Hills and throughout the world. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. We believe in prayer. We believe in God the Father and the Holy Spirit, three in one, as Jesus ministers to us and through us. And we believe in in sending. We believe in raising up leaders to send them overseas and that God has sent leaders to us. Part of the reason I'm thrilled that Rick was here and we have someone from RCC, those are probably our two biggest funding partners as a church. People that said, we believe in what God's doing and through Vintage Grace, we want to get behind that through prayer, through practical support as well. And I even hate that phrase, prayer and practical support. Because don't we have a feeling that prayer is not practical? So we say things like that, right? We say things like prayer and practical support. And I'm excited this morning because we're going to open the word and we're going to hear from our first Stamps intern for his first sermon. So I'm thrilled. Chris, would you come on forward? And I just want to pray over Chris as he brings the word and helps us with some of those phrases like, well, I guess all we can do is pray. So Father God, we believe that. We believe in you, we do believe that all we can do is pray, and we do believe that your word is powerful. So as Chris opens your word, I pray that you bring it through him. I pray that we hear from you, about you, and that we love you more dearly because of it. That as we continue this Desiring God series, that as we leave this morning, we would desire you and have a better understanding of how we do talk to you, how we do interact with you, and how we do receive love from you. We pray this in your name and all those people said. Amen. So there's about 12 guys sitting in a circle. They're talking with one another, and you know, they, they've been on different journeys, and so they haven't seen each other in a while, so they're catching up, and, and it, it's good to be back together. One guy's you know, messing around, drawing circles in the sand. Another guy's counting how much food they have for lunch. And then, and then a common topic comes up, something they've talked about multiple times. They're talking about their teacher. And they're talking about some of the weird things their teacher does. Namely, the fact that he wanders away sometimes. You know, sometimes he'll hike up a mountain by himself. Sometimes he'll stroll through a garden by himself. Sometimes he just disappears entirely. And they're trying to figure out what this is all about. You know, he, he, he's told them in the past, I'm going away to pray. But they don't really get that. They don't understand what that means. But he does this really often, so it must be important. But if it's so important, why hasn't their teacher taught them what it means to pray yet? You know, if he does this every day for hours on end, and they're his students and he's their teacher, why hasn't he brought them in in and said, this is what prayer looks like? You know, one guy pipes up and and says, hey, remember our other teacher, John? Some of the the other students are like, yeah, I remember that guy. 
He says, well, John taught us how to pray. And they're like, oh yeah, that's right. John did teach us how to pray. Why isn't our current teacher taught us how to pray? And as I'm watching this scene unfold, I start to wonder like, well, man, if their teacher is such a great teacher and all these guys are following him, why hasn't he taught them how to pray? Why, why hasn't he made this uh, a point yet? And so as they're wrestling with these ideas of, man, why, why isn't our teacher taught us how to pray? One by one, they get a, l- a little quieter. And there's, the hush falls, falls over the crowd. And, and, you know, the one guy's still talking. And everyone's trying to be like, all right, like, pipe down. Like, that's enough. And, and then it's that moment where that person you've been talking about is, like, standing behind you. And so their teacher walks up. And it's quiet. And maybe out of bravery or frustration or pure curiosity, I don't know, one guy pipes up and he says, Lord, Teach us how to pray as John taught his disciples. And so Jesus says to them, when you pray, say this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread And forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This morning, we're talking about prayer, and I'm really excited because I think prayer has this, you know, convoluted, ambiguous sense to a lot of us, uh, that it's some weird, magical phrase we recite every once in a while or we say, you know, God, thanks for this food, amen, and that's kind of the extent of our communication with God. And I want to strip prayer down to its basic core this morning and say this, this is what prayer looks like. This is what it looks like to commune with our creator. And so before we go any further, I want to stop and just take a minute to quiet our hearts and to ask God to, to help us understand such a, such a deep and rich component of our relationship with God. So Father, this morning, in this moment, We ask, we pray that you quiet our hearts, that you help us to think rightly about you. God, that whatever whatever emotions the word prayer conjures up in our minds and our hearts, that you'd help us to sift through that. Help us to see what your desire for prayer is. We pray this for your glory and for our joy. Amen. So a few weeks ago, I was at the chiropractor. I've had back problems for about 10 years now. When I was in high school, I went surfing and took a wave that I really shouldn't have and bailed really hard, got out of the ocean, realized my back was messed up. Uh, So the next day, I went and played 18 holes of golf. (laughs) Yeah, and then spent three months in physical therapy for that. Um, So that that kind of started my back problems. When I was in college, I was was playing soccer, and I I was hauling butt after the ball, Sorry, I'm a youth pastor. I, the words I say are going to be a little different. Anyways, um, I was hauling after the ball, and I was almost there, and this dang guy who was probably about twice my size got right in between me and the ball, and my head hit him, and my body kept going, and I got up and was like, man, that does not feel good. So I finished the game, rode my bike home, went to the chiropractor the next day. Needless to say, I had uh, fractured one of my vertebrae, slipped a disc, um, had to go to physical therapy again for months and months and months. So I'm no stranger to back pain. For those of you who have you know, experienced something like that, you know how painful and how annoying it is and how it just messes everything up. And so a few weeks ago, uh, I woke up and my back was kind of hurting and it was that same spot that I messed up in, in college. And so I laid down on our foam roller thinking that this would help and rolled a couple times and then same thing, that shooting pain shot through my back, you know, tingly and numb and just one of the worst pains I could think of. And so after going to the chiropractor, they said, yes, you slipped your disc again. Um, you'd think you would have learned by now, but you've got to stop doing that. Uh, and, and as I was, you know, looking at some of my x-rays, uh, so this is, this is not what your spine is supposed to look like. On the left, we have uh, that picture of the two spines. The the right side picture is what your neck is supposed to look like. The left is what my neck looks like. Um, This picture, this big one right here, um, I'm sure you guys know, even if you're not a doctor, your spine is supposed to be straight. It's supposed to be aligned. Mine isn't. It's clearly off. There's something wrong there. And when my back goes out, when my spine is out of line, everything physically and emotionally is just off. 
You know, I get really bad headaches, my stomach hurts, I'm exhausted, but I can't sleep. And, and it's just this constant remi- reminder of my body telling me, hey, something isn't right. You, you need to get back in line. And I was thinking about that, and I was talking to my chiropractor. He helped me realize this is such a beautiful picture of our relationship with God. When, when things aren't lined up, when our affections aren't lined up with, with what God wants and in his heart for us, Everything is out of whack. Our, our, our emotions, our relationships, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, everything is out of whack. So this morning, uh, I want to think about what it looks like to align our affections, our spiritual alignment with God. Because when our affections are off, we totally miss God's heart. When what we desire isn't in line with God's will, we miss his purpose for our life and we miss the joy that he has in store for us. And so I want to think about how we align our affections, how we get back in line, it's almost uh, as if prayer is our spiritual chiropractor. Thinking of, you know, when we commune with God, it allows us to, to take our affections and look at them through the lens of what God's desire for our life is. And so this morning, uh, we want to kind of break apart what that looks like. Martin Luther said it best. He says, being a Christian without prayer is no more possible than being alive without breathing. Being a Christian without prayer is no more possible than being alive without breathing. And so I want to start us off with a simple definition of prayer. And this comes from pouring through the Bible, looking at what God's word has to say about how we communicate with him and, and, and what it looks like as we talk with God. And so I think it's simply intentionally communicating so intentionally, being intentional with what we say and how we listen and what we do, intentionally communicating with our creator who knows us so, so deeply and so passionately and loves us so desperately for our joy and for his glory. And those are the, the two most important components of prayer. First, it's for our joy and that as we commune with God and it's for his glory that he is glorified. And so I think the Bible paints two pictures of prayer. Uh, the first being this self-glorifying prayer. Prayers that, that are all about me, all about what I want. And then the second is the God-glorifying prayer. It, it's what does it look like when my affections, when what I'm praying for, with how I'm communicating with God lines up with his heart and his will. So I think there's four types of self-glorifying prayers. And we're going to pull those apart this morning. And then we're going to look at uh, what it looks like to, to pray and communicate with God in a way that glorifies him. I think the first type of self-glorifying prayer is what I call misplaced affections. It's when we say, God, please give me a raise. God, please give me a bigger house. Please give me a, a better golf score. Uh, with my back, my golf score is terrible. And so I'm constantly praying, God, please give me a better golf score. Give me fame. We all want to be known. Please, please give me more people to meet my needs. Please give me bigger 401k. Please give me more security. And I think, and this is coming out of my own heart, and I think this might resonate, but the underlying prayer thought when I, when I pray for these things often is because I think it will bring me more joy than God. None of those, well, some of those might be inherently wrong, but, but some of those are inherently good. And when we experience our joy in them, you know, I, I think I would be more joyful if I had a better golf score. But if I think that's going to bring me more joy than trusting in, in God and getting to know him better, it's misplaced affections. It's when here's my affections and here's God and I'm just shooting stuff, you know, I, I'm praying for ridiculous things because I don't genuinely trust that what he has is going to bring me more joy. It's when we pray for things that we think will bring us more joy than God. And I think it's a little bit ironic and because we're, we're praying to the creator of the universe who makes the whole world spin and flow and loves us so desperately, I think it's a little ironic that we pray to our source of joy for things that we think are going to bring us more joy. And so I'm constantly reminding myself and keeping myself in check that am I, am I praying for something because I think it'll bring me more joy than God or because I want to use it for his kingdom purposes? And so that's the first uh, way to tell if, uh, if our prayers are out of line, if we're praying for things because we think they'll bring us more joy than God. The second is what I call uh, this unsaid prayer. And it starts with God help those who. For me, it's, it's after I go to Chick-fil-A and I have this awesome meal sitting in my truck and I'm driving home and I, and I get up to the corner and there's that, that guy on the, on the corner and he has a cardboard sign and he says, like, hungry, anything will help. I look at my food. I look at the guy. 
look at my crisp cut fries and my spicy chicken sandwich, and I look at the guy and I say, Lord, please bring someone to give that guy food. <laughs> and then I drive home like, gosh, I'm an idiot. It's that person at work that makes us uncomfortable who doesn't really have any friends or, or you know, doesn't really connect with anyone and say, God, please bring someone into that guy's life that would, you know, help him understand the love of God. Maybe it's that family member, that friend who's just making terrible decisions and no one's speaking truth into their life and we say, God, please bring someone to speak truth into their life. And again, the underlying issue, at least in my heart, is when I pray this, it's God, please help those who fill in the blank so I don't have to. And I hate admitting this but I think I pray this prayer more often than not. Not please, God, let me be the conduit of grace in that person's life, but God, please let someone else do this so I don't have to because that makes me feel uncomfortable. But I never actually want to admit that to God. And I think the third uh, type of prayer is this defeatist prayer. And again, these are all just coming out of my heart. I'm not trying to you know, beat you guys up. This is genuinely coming from the prayers that I, I pray over and over, and I hate that I pray them, but I want to be open and honest because I think a lot of us are in the same boat. This defeatist prayer that says, God, I want this, I want X, but, and we throw this giant but right in the middle, your will be done. You know, on either end, these might be great prayers. God, would you please give me a raise because I think with more money, I, I can glorify you more and I want to give more to the church. Like, this might be a decent prayer, but we say, but your will be done, and it totally negates that first thing we prayed for. That but, at least in my heart, says, God, I don't think you're capable of doing what I'm praying for. I don't think you're powerful enough. I don't think you're loving enough. I don't think that what I'm, and honestly, I don't think that what I'm praying for is in line with your will, but I'm still gonna pray it, but your will be done. It's almost this Christian phrase we throw in there to, to you know, cover up whatever misaligned affections we're praying for in the first place. The misaligned affections that I'm praying for in the first place. And so we just kind of throw our arms in the air and, and admit defeat and don't cling to that power and the joy that is actually found in Jesus. I think this, and this is the one that I, I might pray the most often, is this emergency backup prayer. It's, it's the, uh, if this doesn't work, can you fix it, God? God, I made this awesome plan, and it looks really good on paper, but for some reason, when I tried to execute this, when I tried to make this happen, it didn't work. So can you please fix it, God? I know you're good at fixing stuff, so please, just like one more time, can you fix my mess? And I don't like praying this prayer, because at the end of it, it helps me realize I didn't actually talk to God and communicate with my creator intentionally in a way that, you know, brings him glory and brings me joy on the outset. I think prayer is not just the last thing we should do, it should be the first thing we do. And so instead of God being this backup plan, our source of power, God doesn't want to be our backup generator. He wants to be our source of power. And the initial, you know, communication that we have with him is not just, oh man, God, I messed up again. Can you fix this mess I made? oh man, God, I, I walked headfirst into that sin again. Can you fix this again? No, on the outset, it, it starts with prayer. And so maybe you resonate with some of these different types of prayer. Trust me, these are all coming straight out of my own heart. But if we look at these, it begs the question, well, if these aren't genuine aligned prayers, if these aren't coming out of this solid foundation in, in our joy in Jesus, what does prayer look like? What is an aligned prayer? And I think one of the best litmus tests is, tests for understanding if our prayers are aligned with God is figuring out if our uh, prayers are, are glorifying God is seeing if, if they're praying to increase our joy in him. Are we praying to increase our joy in ourselves, in our stuff, in our security, or is it praying to increase our joy in him? Because when we pray to increase our joy in him, God is glorified. And, and I don't just make this up. I think this is the biblical witness to what prayer is. John 14, 13 says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. A couple chapters later, for our joy, he says, until, until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. And when I first read these, when I first came to Christ, when I first started treasuring Jesus, I read these verses and I didn't get them. Because I thought this meant you had to end every prayer with, in Jesus' name, amen. And it was always as fast as I could say it. You know, these beautiful prayers with all these fancy words, and at the end, in Jesus' name, amen. 
Like somehow saying those words in Jesus' name, amen, at the end, like coerces God, the creator of the universe, to give us whatever we prayed for. You know, God, I would really love more money in my retirement account. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, I said in Jesus' name, amen. It must work, you know? Yeah, it definitely doesn't work like that. In Jesus' name means that praying, we're praying according to God's heart. Praying according to what God's desire is. When we know the name of God, we know his heart, we know his affections, and we can test if our affections line up with him. And I think one of the best ways to, to see if, if our affections are lined up with him is looking at our prayers, how we communicate with God through the lens of how Jesus taught his disciples. If Jesus thought it was so important to teach his followers, teach his students, teach the ones who would plant the church of the world that this is how you pray, I think it's important for us to look at it today. So we're going to pull it apart and, and, and use it as a lens to view our affections and our desires. So the first is, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. This simply starts us off seeking God's glory first and foremost, saying, God, you are holy, I am not. Hallowed be your name is simply, God, your name is above all names, better than anything else. We can't go forward until we understand who God is, is, who God is and how perfect he is. It's thinking rightly about God. Second is your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I think this is seeking God's will, not our personal agenda. In heaven, God's will is made manifest because everyone in his presence finds perfect joy in him. And so no matter what he says, that is what happens. Yet on earth, we know that isn't what happens. In my heart, I know that's not what happens. I know God's will. God's will is that people will come to treasure him and, and find their joy in him. These little happy faces, that's us. And, you know, our joy is found in God. And then it radiates everywhere else. That is the picture of God's will in heaven. And, and we want that to be on earth. So are our prayers aligned with God in a way that we're praying for other people to treasure him? At Vintage Craze, Drew mentioned it. We, we call this the pray watch list. You know, we have cards, but it doesn't even have to be in cards. It's every person we come in contact with praying, God, would you please use me in their life in a way that helps them treasure you more? I think that is one of the most aligned prayers we can ever pray. God, would you use me in their life to help them treasure you more, or maybe for the first time help them treasure you? So are our, pray, are our prayers aligned in that sense. Next, we have give us this day our daily bread, and I italicize this is my emphasis. I think in my own heart, I, I emphasize the bread part. Not just because I love carbs, but I, I, genuinely, I genuinely pray for, for the provision instead of praying to the provider. It's God, usually, God, will you please give me my lifely bread? You know, I pray it once and then God's going to provide for me for the rest of my life and then we're good. No, it's this day. I can worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. God, this day, help me, help me trust you. Please provide for me right now so that I have to keep being dependent on you tomorrow and the next day and the next day. It's are our prayers increasing our dependence on God or on ourselves? Because a lot of times the things I pray for Come out of this place in my heart that I want security. I want a foundation. I want something that I can lean back on, whether it's a paycheck or a bigger house or a nicer car or, or fame or whatever. It's me praying out of this place in my heart that says, God, I'm not depending on you. I want to depend on myself. So would you please give me the things that I can depend on myself for? And that's ridiculous that I pray that. I know intellectually, I know it's ridiculous. But in my heart, I'm telling you, I still pray those prayers. And next we have him forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And this kind of connects back with thinking rightly about God. It's acknowledging, God, without you, I was dead on the bottom of the ocean floor. I had no hope of ever being rescued. Yet in your infinite love, you chose to save me and breathe life into me. You chose to give me hope. Would you please continually forgive my debts against you, God. And then not only that, when we understand the debts that God has forgiven against us, we can give grace to others. We can be the living proof of a loving God to others. We can be conduits of grace and help other people come to treasure him more. So are our prayers acknowledging that we need grace? And are they helping us stay aligned in terms of being the living proof of a loving God to others? Finally, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
Guys, I'll be honest, this is my least favorite part of the prayer. Because normally, I pray, God, please lead me to what will make me most comfortable. Please lead me into, again, birdieing the 18th hole and everyone thinking I'm great. God, please lead me to where I think I need to go instead of, God, please de- you know, deliver me from the evil that this world has to offer. Keep me on this narrow path so that my joy may be complete in you. And this is the most uncomfortable part for me because I sometimes realize that I don't trust that where God is leading me is going to lead me into deeper joy. I, I fall back and I trust myself and I trust my own path. And I think we have the tendency to do that far too often. And so if we look at all this, if we, if we look at the Lord's Prayer and see if our, our affections are aligned with God, what does this practically look like in our everyday life? It's really easy to, to, you know, say, yeah, that's all great stuff, but how does that apply to me? And so I want to break down what this looks like day to day, moment to moment, as we continually, intentionally communicate with our Creator for our joy and for His glory. So I want to break down the who, what, where, when, why. I think <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians does this incredible job. Paul uh, is one of the, you know, easiest guys to understand, so we're just going to pull apart his stuff. Uh, and Charles Spurgeon, one of my favorite theologians, said that, it's incredibly imperative to understand verse 17 in, in the context of, of 16 and 18. Paul says we need, not just we need, we'll be more joyful when we pray without ceasing. Clearly that doesn't mean, you know, 24 hours a day verbally talking to God and, you know, bowed head and hands uh, folded in this uh, posture we assume that we have to be in prayer. No, pr- praying without ceasing is this constant attitude of prayer. And he starts off by saying, rejoice always. And if that's not one of the most difficult things to do in the world, I don't know what is. Because we've all been in those moments where, you know, the last thing we want to do is rejoice. When we get the call from the doctor and he says, yeah, it's cancer. I don't want to rejoice. When we get laid off at work, the last thing I want to do is rejoice. I want to be bitter. You know, when, when things don't go our way, we don't want to rejoice, yet Paul says rejoice always. So how do we do this? Almost as if anticipating his reader's reaction to this, he says pray without ceasing, be in this constant attitude of, of making sure our affections are aligned with God. And then the natural response from that is going to be giving thanks in all circumstances. Because when we're praying without ceasing, constantly communicating with God in a way that you know, increases our joy and His glory, It's going to bring joy into every circumstance and we're going to give thanks for every circumstance. That is being aligned with God. That is when our our spiritual spine is healthy and right and not all crooked. That's what God's will is. And the who, I think, starts out me and God. It's you individually sitting with your creator as uncomfortable or, or as comfortable as that may be. It's sitting and getting to know God's heart. And then secondly, it's we and God. Jesus modeled not only getting alone to, to pray by himself with, with the Father, but praying with other people, praying with his disciples. And, and so it's this collective. We come together Sunday morning and, and in life group and any other time that we gather with believers to pray to God and hear his heart. And this is, my fa- this is one of my favorite parts about prayer. We can do it anywhere and everywhere. We can do it at the gym at home, reading your Bible, sitting alone, driving, at work, watching Jordan Spieth lose the Open Championship by two stinking strokes. And let's be honest, sometimes my my most genuine prayers are out of those silly frustrations. It's, God, why am I so mad that this 21-year-old golfer, you know, shot 14 under and, and missed the Open Championship and missed getting the Grand Slam and everything? Why am I so mad at that? Well, because my affections were out of line. It didn't grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter what Jordan Spieth shot. It doesn't matter. What matters is the joy that I find in Jesus. But out of those frustrations are some of my most genuine prayers. And again, this brings us back to the why. Why do we pray? Why do we want to intentionally communicate with God? Well, it's for his glory and it's for our joy. They go hand in hand. But it starts it, as, as simple and as complex as this is, it starts with simply praying. And again, this can be anywhere. This can be everywhere. There's something to be said about getting alone and intentionally sitting with God. But it starts with simply communicating with God because when we communicate with God, we get to know Him deeper. And when we get to know God deeper, 
we find more joy in him. It's the natural response. When we find more joy in God, it makes us want to know him better. And when we, when we want to know God better, it makes us want to pray more. It's this natural cycle, but the, but the first step is always the hardest part. It's saying, God, I don't want to pray right now. Sometimes, my, again, my most genuine prayers are, God, this is uncomfortable. It's been longer than I care to admit. God, there's some stuff that I don't really want to deal with. God, I don't like what's going to come up in my heart if we sit and pray. But taking that first step in saying, God, I know that I will find more joy in you if I choose to pray, if I choose to intentionally communicate with you than if I, if I didn't and I let our relationship fall. And so this morning, whatever emotions prayer brings up, uh, I want to speak... I want to speak a blessing over you. If prayer brings up this shame, this guilt of when I do pray, I I don't pray good enough, and when I don't pray, God's mad at me, those are lies. Those are not understanding God's heart in, in communicating with him. Prayer is intentionally communicating with our creator for his joy for our joy, he gets joy out of it too, let's be honest. <laughs> for our joy, for his glory. So Father, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. And God, would you please lead us away from temptation, away from evil, and into this aligning relationship with you. Father, we pray this for our joy, that you would be glorified and magnified for who you are in heaven and the grace you've given us. Amen.